Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Klitzing. I'm the uh, director of Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation. And I want to welcome you to this uh, third public meeting for the Bear Creek Park Master Plan. Uh, before we get started, and I, it's great to see the, the group of people that we have here today, a uh, great number of folks, uh, especially on a nice cold night here in Indiana. I um, want to get a feel for who we have in the audience. Uh, I'm not going to get specifics. I'm not going to, we're not going to do introductions, but kind of where you're coming from or if you've been to meetings before. So uh, please raise your hand if you have attended the previous public meeting for Bear Creek, whether as a, a, a public meeting like this or were invited to a focus group. So we have a, a few that have been to uh, several of the other meetings. Uh, how many of you live west of Meridian Street? Okay, vast majority. Uh, how many live north of 141st Street? Okay. How many uh, live uh, either immediately adjacent to Bear Creek Park or within a mile of Bear Creek Park? Very good. So we've got a, a fair number of neighbors here. So that's, that's absolutely great. Well, tonight is sort of not the culmination of our planning process. We're still very much in the listening stage, but this is when things start getting a little bit more real and we start getting some design concepts to get reaction from. I wanna first and uh, foremost say that none of the plans that we're gonna be presenting to you tonight are likely going to be the final product. Uh, what we have done over the previous meetings that we've had, and we've met with a wide variety of, of individuals from from elementary school uh, kids to neighbors to different organizations and stakeholders. Um, so we've been listening a lot, and now what we're doing is presenting some concepts of what the park looked like based on that feedback we've received. Ultimately, what we anticipate will happen is we're gonna get feedback that says, oh, I like a little bit from plan A and, and this from plan B and, and this from C, and I hate this from, from various plans as well. That's part of this process, and, and you're gonna see a wide variety of concepts of what this can be because we're trying to facilitate that discussion to, to understand what the community truly wants. And up to this point, we've been talking a little bit about well, these types of activities and these types of preservation of open spaces and, and nature and these types of uh, buildings and, and playgrounds, but really haven't gotten to anything specific. Now we're getting a little bit more specific so that you really can react to them and that reaction will help us develop a, a draft of the master plan that will be presented to the park board, uh, which will be uh, something that everyone will make sure everyone that comes to the meetings or we promote that uh, you can come and listen to that. And then uh, we'll ultimately have the park board, uh, based on any final feedback we receive, create a master plan. So that's the process here. Again, we're a long ways from the end part. We're still very much in the listening part. But uh, it, it's, like I said, when it starts getting a little bit more real and getting ideas of, of really what that park could potentially become. Uh, I'm also really excited about this because Bear Creek Park, you know, is, is something that has been on the wish list for Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation almost since its inception 30 years ago. Uh, I uh, started with the department 18 years ago in this coming July. And when I came, the goal was to find some more parkland in West and specifically Northwest Carmel. Uh, I've been director now approximately three years and this was one of the first major acquisitions that I was able to do. So it's really exciting to be able to preserve some additional open space within the community and uh, begin fulfilling uh, one of the visions of the park. Board. So we're really excited about that. But uh, now we get to listen to you and, and see how well we've been listening so far and identify where we go from here. Um, before we get started, I do want to recognize a couple dignitaries that we do have in here. I have a, a couple park board members that have joined us tonight. Uh, Jessica Beer, if you would stand up, way, or at least way, as well as Mark Westermeyer, who also has the uh, distinction of being my immediate predecessor. So uh, thrilled to, to have Mark on the park board and, and continuing to provide wisdom to everything we do. Uh, with that, I want to make introductions first of uh, Greg Calpino. He's with Smith Group, uh, who we engaged to uh, lead us through this planning process. And I'll let Greg uh, introduce the rest of the planning team. Sure. Thank you, Michael, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, great to see some familiar faces and some new faces uh, tonight. So yeah, I'm Greg Calpino. Uh, I'm a principal landscape architect and park designer with Smith Group, and my partner, Jay Blues, over there. I'm a landscape architect, Andy Collins. 
now just I'm the project manager on the Bear Creek Master Plan Project that's been approved. We've got a couple partners sitting in the front row over there as well, architectural partners. Hi, uh, Greg McCollum with Synthesis Incorporated here in Indianapolis and uh, architect for the project. Janelle Sagawa, also with Synthesis. Pro's Consulting, uh, Nile, uh, unfortunately, I had to stay home tonight, but uh, he, and he would raise his hand on all of your questions, even in terms of where he lives as well, too. So that really makes up our full consulting team. Can we bring the house lights down just a little bit? The house lights, that sounds very dramatic. Yeah. So we're going to um, hopefully have a little bit of time to look at the boards around the room here, but we're um, going to take you on a, a little tour. For those who are new to the process, we have a little bit of background on where we've been over the course really the last year. Uh, but our main focus is going to be on where we're going in terms of um, putting pen to paper and showing you maybe what the, this park could actually look like from a design standpoint. So um, we always sort of start with this. This has been, a, uh, this has been to Michael's point, uh, a kind of Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation's next great adventure in terms of finding, finally finding a property in a park in a part of town that's needed it um, for a lot of reasons and with the growth and, and, and such too. So, uh, but it's a great adventure from, from that perspective as well as design process for us as well too. So uh, onward with the adventure. So where have we been so far? So, um, you know, starting, I think Jay pointed out, it was, I think it was snowy and, and icy the last, when we started the process, uh, we've intentionally sort of worked a little slower than a lot of planning processes that, you, that maybe you would have seen in other parks, including the design for this. Part of it is we, we have a brand new park and we wanted to give you all a chance to start to experience it as well as ourselves, see it in all the seasons, get out there, really learn about it before we start you know, making up our ideas for what it wants to be like. So we spent our time doing that. We were here uh, again earlier last year, you know, really part of the listening process, starting to walk the site uh, over summer. Uh, in November, we were here um, and we started to kind of unveil some, some of the kind of uh, um, summary of what you were telling us you wanted to see in the park, which you didn't, didn't want to see in, in some planning themes, things like that, defining what the program wanted to do for the park so we could actually start designing they are today. And so that really brings us to workshop number three, which has been really a kind of a two-day process starting yesterday with meeting with kids, various stakeholders, neighbors, um, and culminating with this meeting tonight. So this is really what the, um, our goal is for this, you know, the meeting and, and really the, the current workshop that we're in. Uh, a little bit of background of, of, of what we, we heard in the last meeting. We are going to spend most of the time again sharing some of the ideas on the alternatives and with your feedback, um, we'll start to get ourselves towards a preferred direction, which will become the master plan for Bear Creek, Bear Creek Park, and eventually with the park that you'll be able to visit. So some of the summaries of, of what we've heard so far. When we were with you all and your in other members of your community in June, July, we went through a process where we asked you to help us understand the level of development that this park should have. <coughs> Excuse me. Recognizing that there are some ecological assets on site today. Um, for those of you that have been on site, you've, you've had a chance to see those are some prairie areas. There's an oak plantation that the previous landowner had established. But also recognizing um, the need of this park, that it's in the northwest corner of the city, and that that corner of the city is growing. The population base in that area is, is predominantly, um, apologies, if you are the presenter, make sure you turn your ringtone off. Um, it was my wife, by the way, in case anybody was worried. Um, so, uh, that was a great way to distract me. Um, <laughs> we were talking about um, the level of development that we wanted out here, recognizing that there is a community that's established around this park and that that community is predominantly, uh, there, there are a large number of family-based units with predominantly smaller kids. I mean, most of the kids in, that, in those neighborhoods are our elementary school to middle school age children, and that this park will be the closest, the, their community park. It'll be a park that is in one to, the, one to three mile ratio of their home, and so there is some development level that's required. So one of the things we had asked you all was, where should this park fall on this particular gradient? And not surprisingly, we heard some, somewhere in here from most people. So we we had gone through in our first workshop a number of different themes and yeah, trying to understand you know what you were most passionate about. Do you want you know to, to Jay's point, more nature, you know more play, more connections, more trails, those sorts of things. So we had some really good feedback of what you wanted to see more of, what you wanted to see a little less of. 
but they really started to fall into a couple different themes here of an activated park, again, to Jay's point, a place, if it's your only park, it does need to have some of those basic park amenities, you know, play and things like that. Um, but also recognizing that it's, it's a, you know, it's a very wonderful natural space. It's got topography, it's got a creek through it, it's got prairies, and so making sure that we don't lose that essence of it. Um, and then we keep doing what Carmel Clay uh, Parks has always done, is, is be a, a model of resilient to park design. Um, but then also thinking about connections. And you know, there's the, the sort of the basic level of thinking about trails and cars and, and getting to the park from one to three miles or further, but also thinking about you know, what are those programmatic connections, educational connections, cultural connections, that this park actually starts to become part of the community, not just a place that you drive to. And that led us to, um, this was really the end of our last meeting, which was a broad vision for the park, uh, which I'm not gonna read all the words, but the, kind of the big thing to take away from this is, again, a balancing, and you'll hear the word balance a lot. Um, that really is successful there, there is a middle there, um, as all that diagram should have, is, is really trying to find that balance between that activated escape, so nature, but a place to do fun stuff and be active and you know, play and gather and, and all of that, um, uh, to make a connected experience again, physically from a cultural and educational perspective, but also thinking about doing that all you know, as an ecological model as well as how it operates as well too. Since, since this is a new park, we have, um, and as Greg described, we've taken a longer, slower process. It means that you all have had an opportunity to engage in being on site. And since opening, I, I'm not going to recall, what was the opening? Do you recall when we opened it? October? Ish. Okay. <laughs> October ish. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been about 250 people that have visited the park. These images that you're seeing here, that's, these are images that you and your neighbors have taken and then shared with CCPR and said, hey, you can share this. But these are, these are wonderful images of the park that uh, you all have collected. And it's exciting to see the activity and the energy of people that are visiting the park. If you haven't been there, I'll just let you know, it's open on the weekends. It, uh, there is a little, small little parking lot next to the barn and there are trails cut in. So absolutely, go out there and visit the park if you haven't been there. And so, you know, getting back to the, the role of this park, it is the only community park in this part of town, but it actually will serve a little bit beyond that because it's right on the border of Carmel Plain and neighbors. Um, but yeah, so, so it connects to a lot of neighbors that are there today. Some of you are probably those neighbors, as well as neighbors to come. That there's new development happening all around us as well, too. So it's a growing community that's going to keep on growing. And there's other resources happening to the north and the south, and, and some of these roads that are getting bigger and more connected are also those conduits for people to come to uh, this park as, as that community park. But typically, a community park does serve you know, a, a one to three mile radius, so it sort of fits the idea that you would bike, walk, and drive through this park. Um, it also is very well connected from other kinds of corridors, the natural, um, you do have watersheds flowing through here, they become greenways and blueways for habitat and for people as well too. So think about how this park works, you know, from a more regional perspective is important. But then thinking about the park itself, okay, um, it really is kind of an e interesting kind of, you know, it, it's, it's a large park, you know, you know, in terms of, you know, 26 acres is, is a large space, but it's not a giant park compared to West Park, for example. But it's got a great sort of breakdown of rooms that are really kind of nature inspired that are driven by the open prairies. Some of this idea that if you go to the north of the park, there's a series of gridded oaks up there that really create these sort of rooms. And you know, so those those sort of spaces that create you know a, a character also are part of the natural uh, ecology up there that are, 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 are prairies and the creek itself, some of the woodlands and old plantations that, that uh, were planted maybe 20 years ago. And then you know there was you know with all that it was a human landscape as well too. So while those natural spaces are, are great, they have great character. Um, they're not pristine, and so they are opportunities in some cases where uh, maybe there was a, a heavier hand of, of human. Or there was, you know, previous development, the house, the bar, and those might be kind of cues to where we might think about putting things that are more active-based uh, and maybe staying away from, from the other, other areas that are maybe are a little more sensitive to prairies and the uh, area along the creek. And when we came back and we met with you in November, one of the things we asked you all about in your in your community and, and your neighbors was of the type, different types of uses that we've explored, where should they fall? So we broke the site down into a series of zones, four different zones, and what you're seeing here is basically the responses we got back, but I'll make it really simple. Uh, concentrate the types of uh, development and access experiences sort of towards the edges, and really look at focusing on restoration and habitat development in the core of the park, 
with one notable exception, that there might be really this opportunity for some kind of unique play experience down here at the core of the park. That meant, um, as we saw it as designers, this idea of a connected, a resilient, and an activated park experience. And that's really what drove our design development as we prepared concepts for you all. So when we last left you, we had that vision with the Venn diagram. We also had these sort of big three design drivers that we sought your feedback and those who were here. Um, and you know, with they seemed like we were on the right track. So they, they went from being words and drivers into things that were starting to shape what we draw here and how we gauge what we draw that we're doing, we're being successful to these. So the idea of a bigger bear, uh, which is really about ecology and thinking about Bear Creek itself being a, a bigger influence of, the, of this park, the idea of bear sightings, which are the activities, the adventures that you have in the landscape, and the idea of engaging the bear, which is starting to think about, again, you know, what do you do here as a resident, as a neighbor, so that you can experience that, that Bear Creek environment, but also do it in a way that's sensitive to the, to the bear itself. And so we, we took those big ideas and started to think about these as ways um, to really start to look at three different approaches to design. We call these design levers. The idea is for each of these, and there's four of them, there's sort of one extreme that might be, you know, uh, you know one treatment you know, might be the, the least invasive, for example, and the other end of the spectrum might be, you know, a much more uh, aggressive uh, move in terms of, you know, in this case it might be topography and watershed. The next one might be the same idea for habitat. You know, one might be similar to what you have today, one might be something much more elaborate based on some of those you know, bigger changes from the watershed. The same thing, kind of thinking about the bear sightings, that, you know, where's the activity going to be in the park? And so we intentionally have thought about this differently in each scheme where one scheme might look at you know, a much more concentrated um, activity zone to the north of the park, and we might conversely look at one that splits in the north and the south to kind of see you know, what do you think might be the best you know, combination of, of, of programming areas. And then the same thing finally with this idea of engaging the bear, which really gets into where some of the facilities go, where roads, where parking, where trails, the connectivity goes. And again, intentionally thinking differently about uh, you know, how those are handled. And, and one you know, big difference that you'll see as we get into the details is, you know, should there be a connection between the units you know, with trails or with cars? So we're looking at all those different options as some of the differentiators as you look at the scheme so that um, we'll hopefully get your input on what of those you like and what you don't like. We've also been looking and thinking very carefully about how architecture and built spaces should be developed within the park and exploring several different types of models. There's a, a single uh, marquee building type of model. There might be a model that looks at maybe two smaller, more moderate sized structures that have some sort of relationship with one another. There's a campsite or a, or a campus type of model where you're really looking at a series of smaller structures that share a, a, a group of open space together. Then there might be a model that really looks at mobile and uh, pop-up kind of experiences within the site. And those are all sort of ways to think about how buildings might relate to one another uh, on the site. But then we also have been really thinking, this is really, our, our architecture team has really been helping us with this, but thinking through how buildings might relate to the site as well. Um, when we are with this group and your, your peers and your neighbors uh, in June and, and again in, in July, or I'm sorry, again in November, um, you know, we heard this strong idea about tree houses or canopy play, so really thinking about how there might be structures that, that layer into the ecology of the site. Then there could be structures that become tower-like, beacon-like structures that are these points of identification within the park. There can be these, these, these sort of flag spaces or these ideas that there are places within the park that, where you have these gathering nodes, these gathering pockets. And then there's ways to think about architecture and built environment in terms of how it might um, enhance or, or advance the ideas of adventure and exploration and, and the excitement of the space. Now, one of the things that was really important uh, in, in all of the previous uh, meetings that we've had with your community, because this is a community park, because of the way that people are using parks today in a post-COVID environment, uh, is this idea of living spaces. Today, the way we use parks is different than we did three and a half years ago. It's not uncommon for someone to walk into a park, flip open their laptop, open up their iPad as, as a professional uh, consultant or an employee, and they work for two and a half hours in the park. They're doing, they're doing work work. Or students are showing up at a park together, and they both, you know, the three of them flip open their, app, their, their um, laptops or they open up their tablets, 
and they're doing homework together in the park. And parks have now become this, they've become these quasi-living spaces where work is being done, but there's also different types of play that's happening there. We've historically thought of parks as the playground kind of place or the splash ground kind of place, but they are certainly these places where there's levels of interactivity with art, and people are using these, these park spaces as almost a, a living extension of their home. And as a community park, that kind of understanding becomes very, very important. How can we provide that level of flexibility within this park? That led us to three different concepts that Greg and I are gonna to present to you tonight. We're calling the first concept Bear Towers, we're calling the second concept Braided Bear, and we're calling the third concept The Wandering Bear. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk you through the design levers we use to, to develop each of the concepts. <clears throat> then we're gonna show you some of the key design elements in those concepts and walk you through what the key design elements are within each concept. We'll share some precedent imagery with you to help you understand the ideas that we're trying to present, the, the aesthetic intent or the experiential intent that might be presented in any, any one of the concepts. And then we're gonna, when we're all done with that, we'll take questions and we'll walk through how we would like to collect some data from you all tonight on these boards. So beginning with the Bear Towers concept, if we look at the, the two of these design levers, I'm gonna talk through the grading or topography design lever and the ecology design lever. What we proposed in the um, <coughs> Bear Towers concept was to essentially leave the grading as is. You'll also note that um, you'll see a little bit different stream geology, uh, morphology associated with the, and, and geometry associated with the, with the creek itself and the subsequent concepts. And this particular concept, we've essentially left the creek geometry is identical to what it is today. There'll still be some level of improvement. There's, there is some erosion that's taking place. There's some down cutting. There is some armoring that needs to be done. But essentially leaving it in its, in its current geometry and more or less leaving the site in its current grading condition. From an ecological perspective, there's a band of forest, there's a band of woods that runs along the creek. And um, at, as an ecologist, I'll tell you, it's overwooded. So you've got about 120 to 130% canopy cover. You have a lot of great big um, old trees, especially on the ends, the two ends here and here. And then in between you have um, riparian trees that are probably between 20 and 35 years old. They're not, they're nothing wrong with them from a, from a species standpoint. They're not incredibly great from a habitat value. They're not the most nutritious species of, of trees or anything like that. But the bigger issue is beneath them, you've got a, a very dense layer of invasive species, Tartarian honeysuckle. That's causing a lot of problems. So in this particular concept, what you'll see that we've done is we're suggesting there might be some selective tree removal and then a very aggressive and spaces, invasive species removal and reestablishment of appropriate perennial desirable native species along that ground layer. And then from the activity and, and sort of connection standpoint, this is one, in this concept, we, we start to think about the, the north, you know, north of the creek being the primary activity area. Jay will talk about that in a little more detail, uh, but more of the facilities will be up there, maybe a little bit more parking uh, associated with that. And to the south would be, you know, there would be some uses, picnicking, things like that, would be a little quieter, a little bit, and, but both would be accessed, there would be a road you know, from the north, from the south, parking lot for each, and then there would be a trail system that would connect between the two units, boardwalk along the creek, a couple of bridges across the creek, and a couple of towers, which is really what this last meeting is saying about. So what we're gonna do is we'll walk you through, and these are the, the main features, the key design features in this particular concept, and we're gonna walk you through each of these different design features just to give you a better sense of what they are. Those key design features in this particular example, in this particular concept are the North Camp, the nature and water play area, there's a prairie tower, the bluff tower, which is again why this is called the Bear Towers concept, and then the picnic road. So let's just start with the towers. I mean that's what the concept's named after. The big idea being that there would be these two towers located out there on site. There is a little bit of a grade change here. There's a um, Indiana Bluff, so there's, there's about a 12 to 15 foot grade change that's actually happening right here. So in this particular tower, you're probably using that grade change to help you get a little bit more height, but we're not talking about a terribly high tower probably here. Uh, here, there's this is actually built on a knoll, so there, we are getting some height difference there, but using that knoll and that height difference to give us a little bit higher tower. But uh, absolutely, as you can see from this image, heavily inspired by National Park Service, National Forest Service fire towers or eagle viewing stations that you might be familiar with in state parks or national parks and really trying to create this experience of getting up and above the site. 
Um, one of the things that became really compelling for us as the designers was early on in the process, the parks team went out and they collected some drone photography for us at the site. And how you see the site when you are above the site is very different than when you're in the site. So one of the ways that you can think about this particular concept is really getting all of the users of the park in this bird's eye perspective. You'll only ever be able to see the, bird, the, the site the same way the birds does on the top of these towers. And then the idea, you start to see those little spiral patterns. The idea, again, we've come a long way from the original fire towers all going upstairs. So the idea, actually, that there would be a, a, an accessible journey on your way up, too. So part of that is just accessibility, but part of that is the journey is part of the experience. As I walk up through the canopy, that's part of the experience of getting to the top and sort of finding that bird's eye view. There could be little rooms that are built into that pathway experience as you go up, lots of kind of exciting things. The other thing that becomes exciting for us as we've talked through is this idea is, are there ways then to think about how you can communicate uh, analog methods of communicating between the two towers? Little flashing mirrors, little flags, or something like that that would be kind of a fun way for people to see someone on the other tower and, and have uh, kind of a little communication session with them. The other piece that we're looking at in this particular concept is this idea of North Camp. And in this concept, you'll see um, we're looking at a single uh, marquee structure, like, like the building you're in right now, it may not necessarily look exactly like this building, it may not even be the same size as this building, but the idea being that at, in this particular concept you arrive at a single structure, the structure is a conditioned space, so it's heated, it's cooled, you can be in it in the winter time, you can be in it in the summertime. it can be broken down like these louvers that you've got here to help you break the space down into three different classrooms, but essentially you're arriving at a single building in this particular concept. Now there might be some additional outdoor space, some supportive structures here that allow you to have some plaza space, picnic space, but really you're leaning into, from a programming experience, you're leaning into this one big building to be the space where everyone arrives. So think about, in a lot of ways, kind of how this building works with, with the plaza out here and the lawn over here. Something similar to that would be, um, would work there. As Greg noted, that this particular concept, we're focusing a lot, or we're concentrating a lot of the activity on the north side of the park. So in addition to the, trip, to the uh, tower, and in addition to the one big building, we're also looking at this is where we would have our play and spray. In this particular concept, we're suggesting that you know, maybe, maybe the play is somehow architecturally related to the towers, depending on how those get designed. Um, and the spray here might be the most developed type of spray. We'll see some other examples of splash or water types of play that we're proposing in the different concepts. But maybe in this example, because it's so far removed, maybe it's the most developed. It can still be nature-based, can still be a lot of learning, can still have Archimedes wheels and troughs and trying to understand how water flow works. There's a lot of great physics that people can learn, kids can learn, adults can learn from playing with water. And uh, there's still a lot of opportunity to do that, but maybe it becomes the most uh, developed in terms of the types of spray play experience you can have. In and then the proximity to the tower is intentional. There may actually, that play may actually, the tower may be part of that, whether it's zip lines, high ropes, things like that as well too. The last key feature in this uh, particular concept is this idea of the picnic grove where you might have this, a, sort of a, a family of different size picnic spaces. You already have this in your parks today where you have some larger shelters, a couple smaller shelters, the larger shelters might house you know, a family, an extended family having a barbecue. The smaller shelters might really only have one picnic table or two picnic tables underneath them. That's kind of what we're suggesting. Absolutely having a, a connected lawn space here where you can do a little pick up soccer or frisbee or something like that. And then, um, as I noted before, in this post-COVID condition, really the expectation is that most structures today will be Wi-Fi enabled. When we met with the students, you know, uh, I would say almost to a student, except for maybe some of the very youngest uh, kindergarten elementary students we met with, they all are really interested in this idea of being able to work remotely, do homework remotely, this Wi-Fi enabled experience. So uh, really thinking about all of the structures that would be developed in any of the concepts would have that, that character. And then ending with just some, some additional imagery to help you maybe visualize the different kind of character, aesthetic, or quality that we're suggesting in this particular concept. A much more open creek, um, you know, looking at a fire tower or, or eagle viewing tower kind of experience, uh, maybe more refined splash, uh, you know, different types of, of, of room engagement, yeah, yeah. That, that can happen in that developed experience on, in, in the bear towers concept. Then moving on to the braided bear concept, our second concept. Again, starting with these design levers, 
If we start with topography, here we're making some, some very initial changes to the topography. On the south side, there's an existing swale over here today, and we're going to enhance that. There, you'll see here in a minute, there's a, there's a special reason for that, for this special key feature that we're going to look at in a minute. But enhancing the existing swale, and then pushing the grading on the north side up the slope. And really what we're trying to do is expand that, that river valley. It's very deliberate to make that more of a big belly in that, in that river valley. And the reason for doing that is it allows us then to take the creek, and you can see very different uh, geometry to this creek, right? Very different morphology to this creek. We're braiding the creek. And the braids may not carry water all the time. The intent might be that the braids carry water during the high spring flood periods. But then think about between the braids that you may have these wetland pods or these wetland experiences. So really creating a very different type of ecological habitat than exists today down in the creek bottoms, a much broader creek bottoms, a lot, a bit, a greater increase in habitat area in that kind of wetland experience. And then the other piece here that we're looking at is taking some of that oak experience, the oak plantation is up here today, and starting to pull that down through the site that starts to set up a gridded network that actually the architecture responds to as well. Greg will talk about that. So yeah, so from sort of the activity and the connections, some very big differences from the previous team. As Jay, Jay pointed out, just that overall pattern, taking that oak as an inspiration, that oak grid that you have in the north, think about that as the way that the, the trails and structures start to show up in the landscape. One of the biggest changes you'll see first is in the activity um, slide at the top is in the previous scheme there was sort of the north camp and the play to the north. In this case we've taken the play and pulled it south and so you actually have an activity node really kind of a north camp and south camp in this case and the south camp is up in the trees. So you'll see later as we come to more details here the idea of sort of a tree experience. So very different experience than that. Um, and then from a connections perspective Again, like the other schemes, there is a north and a south entrance, but in this case, we explore the idea of actually connecting them through the park. So think, if you've been to Central Park, think about maybe how the road on the east side of the park you know, kind of winds through the landscape, or think about the bridge that goes over the lagoon, that kind of experience, slow curving park road would connect the north and the south entrance. So the big pieces that we'll look at on this particular concept is the north camp area, then we're gonna spend some time talking about this treehouse play, We'll look at the boardwalk glade area and then this creek stomping feature that we created by pulling that existing swale and enhancing that a little bit on the south side. When we think about how this concept differs from the first concept, in the first concept I described this marquee building that you arrive at that might be like this structure here, different aesthetic, different quality maybe on the inside, different size, but this idea that you're arriving at a single building. In this particular concept we're really exploring this idea that of setting up a, a, a little mini campus. So rather than having one big building you're arriving at, they might be moderately sized or smaller sized building, still conditioned, meaning that you could still use them four, time, uh, four seasons out of the year, so they still have heat, they still have air conditioning. They might have big glass doors that open up, they might have louvered walls that open up. And really the idea is instead of arriving at one big building, you're really arriving at this campus. So the, 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 the um, courtyard lawn space or the courtyard plaza space and being able to move between these individual structures becomes as important as the actual building itself. You're really extending the building experience out into the immediate courtyard plaza space by having a much more perforated open and closed space or indoor outdoor space in this type of concept. And then how you use that outdoor space between those buildings can become, uh, you know, it sort of have these unique different types of, of experiences as well in terms of how you use them. The other thing to keep in mind is as we get smaller with the building, there may be more of a desire to have some of the spaces, the occupiable spaces, go vertical in the building. So you may have occupiable roof decks or green roofs on the tops of the buildings, a little bit different than in, that you might or may not have in a big uh, marquee structure. And uh, the, the, you know, the big play thing that's happening here in this concept is the, the treehouse experience. And, I don't think we have quite yet found the image that does justice to the vision that we have here, but you think about this as having multiple planes of play and experience, multiple planes of occupation. You're coming off the elevation of the old house site right here. As I said before, it's about 12 to 15 feet above the grade of the creek, and really coming out and having this, this sort of uh, uh, boardwalk connected, pathway connected, elevated structures 
out in those canopy trees. They would not rely on the canopy trees for their, for their construction. They'd be independent structures built around the trees. But just having this opportunity to be able to have slides that move between elevation or levels, having uh, zip lines that move between some of these structures, having this whole experience. Uh, if, the, if we were at the bird's eye in the towers, now having the squirrel's eye experience in the tree, right? And, it's, and, and just from a site perspective, Jay pointed out earlier, it's an area where you have some of those largest trees. You also have some of the largest buffers to the park, to, you know, to the west. And the idea of it was the formerly developed area where the house was, so you're, you're set off very far from the southern boundary as well. So think about that house being transformed. You literally think about that with you know, sort of the, tree, the tree tipping sideways uh, being the inspiration. So the original development becomes the new development. Uh, this time it's for play and for everybody. Yeah, it, 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 it is on the property edge, but you can see there's this great existing buffer that exists here. This, uh, this is about 100 feet right here. We did look at maintaining 100 feet of buffer anywhere that there was an existing neighbor. And you can see this is really closer to almost 200 feet right here. And from the south of the edge, edge and, the, and the closest it's neighbor. It's 100 feet. Yeah, multiple football fields. In contrast, and a very different type of experience, but also part of this concept would be this idea of the boardwalk blade. So if you've got these kind of experiences, uh, that, that canopy play happening on the far west side, then in addition to that, what we're suggesting is you have this very, at creek level, at the wetland level, boardwalk experience happening right at grade with that wetland, right at grade with the creek, where you are down by it, you're right there by it. And there may still be a couple of small building structures they may be enclosed like this, or maybe they're open structures down there, but having the opportunity to get down there, those spaces could be used as classroom spaces, they could be picnic spaces, they could be lots of different types of experiences that could happen, but again, you're taking this experience from right here and contrasting it with being right there at that water's level, getting really close to that water experience and, and understanding what's happening with that braided creek that's being developed in this site. It's like an exploded nature center. It's like those little pieces become all over the place that you can start to experience. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. And then lastly, um, we looked at developing this creek stomping experience on the south side. So enhancing that swale that exists today on the south side allows us to create a series of kind of play creek experiences. They could plunge across these different levels and then they could actually, that water can discharge right into uh, Bear Creek. So creating this a very different type of water play experience not as developed as what we saw in concept one up here, a much more nature-based kind of experience, much more riverine type of experience that then allows you to have step that down in a series of maybe uh, steps here until you reach the, or terraces until you reach where it discharges into the creek itself. And a couple images of uh, some of the key features, another kind of image of tree houses, maybe some of the boardwalks or a structure out on a boardwalk, and then we didn't really give you very good images here, uh, but a, a, an image of what the, the bridge could be like uh, in this particular concept. This is a concept that has the bridge coming, the road coming through the middle of the concept. At Central Park. Yeah, yeah you, you're, you should be familiar with this, or I hope you are. The last concept we developed is something called the Wandering Bear. And what you can see happening here is uh, a lot of big changes with regards to the geometry of the creek. We are making, very deliberately making the creek a lot longer. It's by making it do this and not moving as quickly from point A to point B, we're actually increase, we're doing a couple key things. One, we increase the time in duration that it takes water when it enters point A to leave point B. Now that's a good thing for us for a couple different reasons. First, as things continue to develop on the east side of this site, there will be additional impervious area that's developed, and that impervious area is discharging to this creek. So there will be times when you have kind of flashy experiences, and this kind of wanderingness, <clears throat> this longer duration, allows for you to better control how fast water leaves your site. It actually helps provide some downstream flood protection on the, when the water's leaving your site, because you actually take, you're requiring the water to go through a longer process before it leaves. Secondly, by taking the water through a longer process, you're exposing it, you, you've increased the surface area, the length of the creek, which means you're exposing it to a lot more soil and a lot more plants, which allows you to treat more of the water and increase the water quality. So you have a better opportunity to improve the water quality from point A to point B by making the creek longer. 
We do that by also enhancing some of the existing grade changes in the site. So you can kind of start to see these uh, circles here and circles here. We're taking, in this particular concept, we're building off of some of the existing mounds that are there and making this whole site a lot more lumpy. And I'll show you some photos of what we mean by that. But there's a very specific reason why we're doing that. One, it allows us to make, it, it helps us create this windy creek. But also, I mentioned before that today there's a big forest band that runs along um, Bear Creek. And one of the things we've heard from people who visit the park today is that the park feels a lot bigger than 27 acres. And that's because you've got this forest that cuts off the north side from the south side. You can't easily see the north side if you're standing on the south side and vice versa. And by adding, by taking advantage of topography and making this much more rolling and mounding, we're actually using grade changes to make the site seem bigger. Because you're never gonna get a good long fetch of this site, just like you can today. It'll still be restored, it'll still have prairie and savanna on it, but you're never getting that long view of the site. So we're trying to make the site feel bigger than it is by adding these, this lumpiness to the site. And then, sort of finally again, from the activities and sort of the connected perspective, I would say this one starts to become probably the most truly balanced in terms of the activities. Um, you know, there's still a, a cluster of, of some of those sort of campus-like structures, but Jay will explain they're, they're very compared to the previous two schemes. What was the um, treehouse sort of aerial play, these squirrels I view, as Jay put it, has become that picnic row, which has moved over from the barn area over to this area, you know, with its own parking. No roadway connection you know, between the north and the south, but a really robust trail network here. So that, that same experience that Jay talked about, those landforms, they become the wandering bear is the creek. Well, this becomes the wandering experience on the trails, too. So there's probably the potential to have longer trails, more diverse trails, that idea of sort of getting lost in nature. And whether you're on the high ground, whether you're down the boardwalk, that same idea. So really taking that, that, that winding pattern and start to you know, make that come, you know, uh, be the driver in terms of the pattern for trails and that sort of meeting space. So just like we did with the other two concepts, we're gonna look at four key areas. We'll look at the North Camp. We'll talk about this adventure play area, this creek stomping experience here, and the pic picnic road experience. With regards to the North Camp, Contrast it from concept one and concept two, where we had a marquee building and sort of this campus structure in those two concepts. Really what we're suggesting is that you probably have bathrooms and then the remainder of the buildings that are here are open air structures. They're really different size picnicking pavilions or outdoor classrooms, but they're not conditioned space. Or portable, some of those actually could be those portable structures. They could be portable, right. But the intent here is that they're not, they're not conditioned, meaning that Maybe they're only good three seasons out of the year. Uh, you might not be able to use them in the winter. Or you're using them and you accept that you're willing to bring in your hot chocolate and have a fun day out there at the park and still have a hot chocolate day underneath the picnic shelter. Um, but that's really the idea. So you go from a, a marquee building in concept one to this idea of a campus space of different buildings working together in concept two and in concept three having maybe this idea of bathrooms and then a series of smaller picnic shelters outdoor classrooms. More primitive experience. More primitive, thank you. By wandering the creek, by making that much more sinuous, we're also changing some of that grading down there in the, in the creek valley, which means we can take some and make some areas high and place some of the play areas right in the curves, right in the oxbows of the creek. And that's what we're suggesting here, is that in this particular concept, you might have the most nature-based play, and it's happening right down there by the creek. That the kids are coming right down there, it's out of the floodplain, but they're hap it's happening right down there where you have hillside slides and, and trees that are cut and laid on their side, That's those are the climbing structures. Much less refined in terms of the types of material or equipment that's being used, much more nature-based, could, could include loose parts play, that kind of experience. But it's all happening within the curves of the creek. In the same way, we take from a very refined splash, splash play experience in concept one to a little bit different type of splash pay, play experience in concept two to something that's much more about just get, get, get people in the creek, turn the rocks over, find crawdads. Um, we, we asked a lot of kids yesterday about getting money and I'll tell you that you, your kids are not interested in getting this money, but uh, my kids would be. We heard from the school kids, my mom would not be happy if I got that money. One other thing about this scheme, kind of going back to that goal of the resilient model too, 
Jay, what Jay talked about, there's a couple of interesting really points on that. One from the creek standpoint, that this, this scheme two as well, but probably this one mostly, really has the ability to really, you know, take take the hit from the neighbors, storms, really, kind of, and, and be a really great neighbor downstream as well too. So it really start to up what it can do for the community from a stormwater perspective. But the idea of those structures that Jay also explained, really, instead of overbuilding something for the biggest and best, it really lets you sort of build small and add when you need it as well too. So it might be the lightest footprint with the most ability to sort of ebb and flow with the environment too. So from, a, from that, that goal of a resilient model, it really does a lot of things besides just it looks really cool with all the winding trails and everything. And then lastly, in this concept, we have a Southern picnic grill, same sort of thing. You might have, a, a very, very likely would have a bathroom facility and then a series of smaller open structures, uh, flexible lawn space in between. And these spaces could be used for summer camps and or for family, family events or, or whatever. <clears throat> and then some images of how this might work. So you could, here's a good sense of how the trails just kind of get lost into the mounds or how the boardwalks might wrap around a wetland. Um, our vision is that these, these mounds be prairie savanna. The image you're seeing here is actually from a, a California meadow. So the species are wrong, but the, the structure's right. Um, but there might also be times when a uh, parks team goes in there and they mow it, or um, maybe someday if I got my way as an ecologist, you could burn it, um, and you'd have these incredible, amazing, it's, if you've never seen a great prairie, controlled prairie fire, and rolling, watching it roll over hills, it, it's, it's worth popping some popcorn and attending when they, if they get to do that someday. Um, but we also heard from the kids, hey, for the two days that it does snow uh, in Carmel, we'd love to have a great sledding hill too, right? So, um, so, th so those are our three concepts. There's, there's a couple key things I want to point out before we take questions. One of the things that we did uh, when we developed all of these concepts was to look at what is the level of development. So we did what are called takeoffs, where we measured how much developed surface there is within each one of these parks, and how much of the park would be turned over to ecological habitat or restoration area. And I'm really happy to tell you that within one or two percentages of each other, all three of these parks have about a 20% development area and 80% habitat uh, ecology area. So even though they have a, all of them have a very different look, and when you look at it, you might say, gosh, it just, that one's more spread out or that one's tighter. It just doesn't seem like they're all the same. We, we measured it, we measured it to scale, and I'm happy to report that all three of these are essentially having a 20-80 split in that regard. So with that, um, we'll take questions or comments that the group may have, and then we will explain how to use these boards uh, following the question and answer period. So yeah, general questions and reactions to what you saw. How about right in front? Um, and we, we can bring the microphone along at all? I, so I, I can talk loud too. All right, bring it on. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm seeing a whole lot of development I'm a little disappointed. I'm 70 years old. I would use this park too. Um, I need more flat trails. Um, I need a place. The kids get to play in nature. You all want to do that. Having a dog, I would like to be able to let loose in nature. The dogs need it too. There are a lot of people who have dogs. So it's going to be a small bark park. <coughs> I would say 
say from from the trail perspective, you know, I, I, they're all, the, the all trails are ageless. They're all accessible in, in okay. all well, in the Indiana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah. obviously you'll have some rolling topography out there, but they all would be accessible. And even the towers, if you want to put yourself up there, they would be accessible. Um, you know, bar parks. Yeah, I think that's something you know you're looking at community wide. Right? Exactly. I don't know if we have enough. To be honest, I don't know if we have enough property with 27 acres to do a bar park and the other things. But that doesn't mean that we aren't looking for the, an appropriate location on the west side. That would be awesome. <laughs> that's my child. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 my, my child has four legs too. So yeah, I, can. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of people. Minor question on, on option two, Brady Bear. Can you explain a bit that are you going to kind of cut the slope back on the north side of the creek to have a seating area? What, what would that look like? Uh, so you, you'd be you'd be grading that slope. Let's jump back to that grading concept. So you are you are increasing sort of the, the steepness of the slope here, but you're. You're, you're actually sort of pushing that slope back. So you're doing a bit of a cut in a slope to make that work, but um, that, that's how you're, that's how you're achieving it. So if it's this wide now, it's this wide in the future, so yeah. yeah. Oh, so it's not like a seating area, a feature where you like a hill to sit on. No, it would, it would be, you would have prairie on it, things like that. But the, the idea is there will be this, the, there is this whole, I don't know that we've refined enough to be able to say, until we've had a chance to talk with all of you to find out where, where your preferences lie. You, there could be seating areas built into any of these trail experiences, absolutely on the boardwalks or associated with the, the canopy play, absolutely there'd be seating. But it's not intended as a big sweeping hillside, uh, seating hillside. It would not be mown, it would have prairie or meadow on it. It would be just creating a, a bigger river valley. A bigger bowl. Bigger oh, not that it's a river, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> it's our river. And, and just to follow up, is, is that the only option, too, that has the road kind of through it? The other two do not have a connector? Yeah, so we, we were only testing the idea of a road cutting through it in concept two. But here's the thing, and this is part of what you will get to do here with your, these boards. You have the opportunity to mix and match this stuff. You can look at it and say, man, I really like that idea of a, of a road starting at Shelbourne and going all the way through to uh, Voyager Way. I think that makes a lot of sense. But I actually like that better with concept one. If you can give us that feedback, yep. we're, we, we would totally welcome that level of feedback. I have a question. Sure. So like looking at all three of them, you say that they're all like 81 people, but option two with the road cutting through, that just looks like a lot of road to me. I mean, this is the image. I know I didn't talk much or anything, but it just seems with all the development and everything, that just like here's a four paved place. And takes away from the natural area because like we all know everywhere is going to get built up around it and that just like I think for the size like it works for Central Park and like even here with them expanding it but I think that's kind of a small area to have that much room and having like two access points it's not you can easily walk from one end to the other whereas like even Central Park they have the east side and the west side but like you can't drive through that because like that you can walk through but it doesn't Some of those examples you just pointed out are why we, we're showing both right now, because we're trying to get a sense of what do you prefer and what is the right balance, because they are good points. You know, this park's 120 acres, Central Park's 160 acres, it doesn't have a you know, connection. So, you know, I, I don't think we're not set right at this point. So they, they're really 50-50 from the team's perspective of what's the right way. But we thought, you know, we've heard, I will say, we've heard feedback on both those other parks. You know, Central Park, this is a design, and we actually have a connection here too. So, um, so yeah, how much, how much is the driving you know, convenience worth it, you know, um, there's an impact, you know, for that. I will say, back to the balance, one of the things the road does in this case is it does carry trails as well, too. So, in some cases, we're getting double duty out of that, and it's a smaller building, so we try to balance, you know, a little less of something else, but it's a little more of that, too. And as Jay said, it's with a couple of percentage points, but, but you're right, it, it does, you know, have a, uh, has a, uh, has a look. It has a look, yeah. It's great to hear the 28 balance and among the three models, which would provide for the most trees and wooded space in that 8%? I don't know that we measured the amount of uh, proposed woods. Uh, they all, 
I mean, the, the intent is that of that 80% it's all ecologically appropriate habitat. So I think that the, the, I don't know that I could tell you what the split is between prairie and woods or prairie and savanna in, all, in any of the three concepts. Unfortunately, I didn't measure that. But uh, the intent is that, it, you know, that 80% is, has an ecological habitat value. I think one thing consistently in all three schemes, we didn't, maybe didn't point out, you know, we, but we kind of briefly, we, we are trying to, and we heard this last time we were, we were here, the importance of having a buffer between the neighbors and the development. So I think the idea of trying to, you know, maintain at least a hundred foot buffer, you know, between the nearest development, but also that might be where we do more of that concentration. Maybe different species though. A lot of cases aren't the right trees. And so um, I would say consistently, you might see more of that blue character that's doing double duty habitat, but also some of that buffering as well. But by all means, some of these spaces might, depending on where we go, could, you know, they can look very different from this yeah, as certainly. drawn. Yep. Just a generic comment, since the county's roundabout system was apparently designed by Albert Jerry, uh, which hopefully someone out there will get that joke, I would be very careful not to put a road through that would end up being a shortcut, uh, because that's kind of a messy intersection. And the looping way you've got it now is fine. It wouldn't be a shortcut, but if you made it a thoroughfare, that would yeah. be a it's, yeah. it's deliberately loopy, so it's inconvenient to make it a shortcut. Yep. And there could be even other moves that, you know, the, the primary move you have, you know, there's a lot of ways we could design park roads so that it's intentionally slow and, and uh, you know, even even ways that the, pro, the road could be programmed in terms of pedestrian use, you know, could be closed at certain times of the week, things like that too. So those are all things. But we are mindful, the last one, to just create a, you know, it wants to be a parkway, not a throughway. And, and, and even if we do not have the throughway, but there's obviously even those would still have that traffic calming things that yeah. keep the traffic down and keep it slow. Yes, Another question back there. Yeah. yeah, so my comment was uh, I think all these uh, concepts are like really great aspects of them. In a perfect world, I would do all of them. But uh, my question would be how much can we incorporate each of the best aspects for each concept all into one giant park? For example, I love the like towers from one park and also expanding the creek and the other. Is it possible to kind of mix and match? I know you talked about it Yes, absolutely. And so, well, but you can't do a braided creek so, and a winding creek. I promise you this panel is not paid. That would be something. Yeah. Uh, but no, that, that's exactly the exercise we're going to do as soon as we're done with questions. Is we would love, I'll explain the exercise, but, uh, but I, I want to continue we'll come back. questions. Yeah. But what you will have the opportunity to do is that up here there are a series of stickers, and um, you all can use a five. five. But I know that some of you are going to break the rule. Every time I say you can only use five, then there's one person who's like, can I tear this in half and actually get six? <laughs> so what we'd like you to do is a couple different things. We've got this board here where we've got all of the different levers that we talked about. So here's concept one, concept two, concept three. You can come along and you can say, I really like the way you handled the grading in concept one, for example, but I really love the buildings in concept two. So put a sticker here or put a sticker here. You can also come along and say, I really love the idea of a marquee building and the towers, but I definitely want this experience over here. So you can help place stickers on these boards to help us identify the pieces. And I'm gonna let you know a little secret. These boards are here for you. So if you all would like to write on the boards, you can. I've provided stickies here. So if you wanna make comments on the sticky, you can. But I am not opposed to someone writing right on the board that says, absolutely love this building. I totally love this, this uh, uh, creek stomping experience. I want that. That's absolutely right. We're going to take the information you all give us today and start to peel, push this together to make a bunch of concepts. You can also, I, I haven't mentioned it, but you can also take any of these images and say, that, 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 yeah, that, that's the look or that's the experience I'd love to see. So when we're done with questions, the boards are open for you all to do. You can certainly also then apply the same thinking to any of those architectural models that I talked about. One marquee building, want that? Nope. 
I like this campsite or this campus idea. That that's interesting to me. So you all will have the opportunity to give us that direct feedback. Good question. That's perfect. Thank you. Sorry for jumping the gun there. <laughs> no, thanks. Oh, it's a perfect lead. In, so. It's like you knew what we were doing. Uh, there was a hand over here actually first. Um, as a homeowner who has direct land right next to um, the park, I appreciate and I encourage that the most development of whatever play area, those types of things are towards the north end because of its proximity to 146th Street and no homes being built there. Um, while I love the concept of fire tower type piece. I don't know that I want the idea of everybody staring at me in my pool in my backyard. <laughs> I mean, that's, so again, I'm not saying no, but really taking those pieces into consideration to where there won't be housing, where there won't be houses. Um, because when we purchased, the land had been deeded to the DNR, um, right, across from us. So. That was part of our purchasing to that point. Sure. Yeah, and I think that the, the distance from the neighbors, the height of some of these things, those are all factors that um, where vegetation is, how deep it is, are all things that will help us decide where things should go or shouldn't go. So I think that's a great point. I I'm glad you brought that up. Make sure that we minimize view sheds of park visitors to our neighbors too. Yeah. We know that you, know, you, you want to have that privacy. And, and quite frankly, most of the. I mean, we know that we'll be responsible as well for sure. putting up more foliage in our backyard um, because it's just, it is what it is. Right. Yeah. There were some other hands over here, I think. Oh. Yep. <laughs> I have a question just about the depth of the creek. Does it look at the creek stopping? And I think with the grave there, that has the boardwalks too. Because I looked at that and I saw my son like, But it, 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 right now in the spring, it's running maybe two and a half feet deep in the summertime. If you have a really droughty summer, the creek may actually dry up. But um, like, like last summer, uh, around July, it was really running closer to like three and a half inches of water, or maybe two and a half inches of water. Uh, on the shoulder seasons, it's running about maybe between eight and eight, maybe 14 inches deep. So is a creek stomp reasonable? Or is it most of the summer? I think it's totally reasonable that you could have a creek stomp. But I also think if you're creek stomping, like in, so really it's only in concept three that we're saying maybe you're creek stomping, maybe either in, a, in something that's developed right by it or right in the creek. But I also think if you're creek stomping, it's totally appropriate for you to understand the phenology of a creek. There are times when it has water in it and there are times when it doesn't. So in some of these other examples where the, the creek stomping happens here, for example, we will be providing the water. You'll have potable water that the kids are playing in, so that we can control and meter how much water is coming in there. But I, there's a phenology to creeks that I think it's worth everybody should know. There's a phenology to nature that you should understand. There's another question in the back. Yeah, I was going to ask if you could comment on the three options on which one has the most conditioned area, covered areas versus like the open buildings you commented. I got the impression that maybe Bear Tower. Bear Towers has um, one. one big condition space. The idea in the braided bear is you might have the same space, but it's broken out across multiple buildings. So the total space might be around about the same, give or take 100 or 200 square feet. Um, the idea being in the wandering bear that you really just have bathrooms that are enclosed and everything else being open. But again, as, I, as we answered this, gentleman, this question over here, you could look at it and say, I really like that idea of open structures on concept one. Put, put, take, those idea, take that idea and figure out a way to make that work on concept one, or vice versa. And, and to give a scope for the side of the study, if they went with concept one with the larger building, we're definitely not talking anything larger than this building, probably something that's smaller. So predominantly, predominantly for parks programming, so it definitely would become a home uh, if we have conditioned buildings 
for our summer camps because uh, we know that our, our camps are hugely popular. A lot of our specialty camps will sell out within hours of, of them opening. We, our, our biggest challenge is capacity, capacity of having enough spaces to host them as well as you know, right now finding people to, to staff them. But uh, so that would be one of sort of the key focus. Also doing additional programming. So like we use this one, there'll be martial arts classes in this building. Uh, we have nature classes that are in this program. So parks programming would be the primary use. There could be opportunities for you know rentals as well for like a, a family reunion or, or, or community uses or if it's in school grounds exactly. as well too. I think that's one of the things we were hearing yesterday. They're interested in those. Yeah, some of the schools have inter been, uh, expressed interest or some of the teachers as far as being able to bring their their students to the park as well. So it could, it could serve those purposes and, and, and community needs as well. There's a question way in the back. I'll come back to you. Hesitation underneath the towers. I don't know that we have it that, that well designed yet, but probably in some sort of vegetation. I, I think it's I, what we're, it's always hard to find a precedent image that's exactly like what's gonna happen in your park, right? So you're seeing images of different towers from different locations. Some of them did happen to have a roadway underneath them, but. They did have vegetation on them, or they did have Yeah, so. They're, they're, we, but, there, are, there are good examples of both, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is probably not part of this project, but do you know if the city's addressed or is looking at the the issue? There's a lot of disjointed sidewalks to the west and south, and there's a lot of neighborhoods going in. Um, there's 40 homes going in just west of me that will not be connected to this, but there's probably, I don't know, a tenth of a mile or something like that of sidewalk to be completed that would then link hundreds of homes to the park. You're absolutely right in that we don't have the jurisdiction over uh, the sidewalks and the perimeter trails, but I do know that the city is looking at filling in those gaps uh, uh, and, and trying to make sure that we are providing that connectivity, especially with the new park coming in. So yeah, I know it's on the master plan. It's been on the master plan forever, but I don't, maybe it would be a priority now. Sure. By the time this park is built. Absolutely. And okay. it never hurts for you to let your elected officials know that that's your priorities as well. And what is the timing again? I apologize. Uh, so for this one, we're, we're still very much in the planning stage. Uh, we will likely adapt the master plan, which is a guiding document for the park board and for staff to follow. Uh, that'll be adopted this year. Um, we will probably, realistically, it's about three years before we have uh, shovels in the ground because the venue go into more schematics and construction design and, and permitting to get it, and the funding to get it done as well. So, uh, so probably about three years before we do that first phase. And to be realistic as well, which has been the pattern for most of our parks, is that it, it's not, you know, whatever the final concept is, it's probably not all going to be built at once unless one of you is hugely wealthy and want to give us a big check. But uh, otherwise, it'll be phased. So we'll identify appropriate chunks that we can do and probably do it over three phases and over, you know, a 10 year time frame. And to be clear, Michael's not fussy, so if three of you want it, <laughs> it doesn't have to be one word. I got the hands up. <laughs> yeah, you want to write a check? <laughs> <laughs> you don't get on immediately. Uh, so I'm looking at like bear towers versus like wandering bears. Um, and I get that like 80% of the park is going to be, you know, call it wild. Um, but if you're going to, if you're going to be making like these mounds and changing the topography a lot, it seems like you're going to be replacing a lot of like the existing Yeah, you're, you're certainly doing more modification in the on the far my left yeah. um, versus the right. Um, I, I think the key thing to keep the takeaway from this is I'll, I'll put on my colleague's hat. There is an ecological value to the space that is out there today. It, it, the, there is a planted prairie. Um, the oaks are have value. The, the understory in that oak plantation is old field. It's not the greatest perennial vegetation that's underneath it. And then um, it's there's some it's very low nutritious value in the in the creek area today, right? That 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 Tartarian honeysuckle is like telling birds to live on heads all the time. <clears throat> That's really I mean super sugary. It's not very good for them. Um, the uh, the reality is that the prairie is it 
it's a planted prairie, so it's not a remnant prairie. We're not looking at the remnants of a historic 300, 400 year old prairie. It, as a planted prairie, it's got nice structure. It does not have a lot of invasive species in it. It does have some, uh, but it, there's nothing there that can't be replanted or redone. So yes, you're changing it, but we're not talking about pristine. And I also think that it's uh, important to note that this landscape is a vestige of uh, somebody's human vision of what that landscape should look like. So, so the previous landowner managed it in a certain way. And in fact, we can have a discussion later, but a lot of our historical landscapes are a vestige of populations that pre-existed us too. They were, they were human managed landscapes. They're, so that level of pristineness is uh, not inconsistent with how ecology operates. Calculations are sort of the end, the end condition. So you know, maybe some earlier disruption, but the end condition would be yep. sort of apples to apples. Is there a hand way in the back? That must have been your question. <laughs> Thank you. Any other general questions, comments, things you love, things you don't love, things we missed? Dogs, I. Well, as a, as a grandparent, maybe this is at a design level you're not too yet. Uh, my oldest grandchild is 13, and uh, uh, when she was first learning to walk, she came over here and we would go to uh, the park next door, and uh, one of the things that she loved when she was three or four, and she's a good swimmer anyway, but she loved the little creek that ran through there. I call it a creek, and then it was just Concrete, but it had a little bit of water flow to it, and she could play. And I hope that, particularly as we get into uh, development of the creek, and I think that's great and all of that, that for the youngest of the kids, they need something like was over at West Park. I don't know, and they, and they uh, in the final design, that's still going to be there. But uh, I would certainly hope we can see some of that. And one of the things we were talking about before, while while many of you were coming in, we had a, a another session with a different group prior to you all coming in with the, the steering team, the steering committee for the project, is this discussion about how you design spaces to ensure that you are providing space for everybody, for someone who is that, that teetle tottle kid who's learning to walk, to the 70 year old who wants to make sure that they're out there using the landscape and recognizing that there needs to be spaces for all of those people and the people in between. And, and in particular, we were talking about the age of the person that's the age of your granddaughter right now, that 13 to 15 year old who doesn't really want to be over here with the little kids, really doesn't want to be on a walk with their grandparent, doesn't want to be by mom and dad, uh, but still wants to be in a park space as well. So how are we, how do we ensure that this park has a variety of spaces? And that's really, I think all three of these schemes try to achieve that, although we're not being very specific and, and, and uh, it's the death nail to say, hey, this is the 13-year-old hangout, because if you say that, they're all gonna go, well, I'm not going there, that's my 13-year-old, that's not for me. Uh, but but the, we do need to make sure we provide space, and then there also, to be perfectly honest, for a healthy community, there needs to be crossover space. We don't want the 13-year-olds being completely secluded from the four-year-olds, from the 70-year-olds, from the 20-year-olds. There needs to be these places where we all mix, because the mixing is the best part of being in a, in a community. Well, some of that has happened pretty well over Central Park with the, with the play area that's there versus what has been at West Park. Much more complex and other things, but the 13 year old can, can have fun over there when she feels then put upon, but her six year old brother can enjoy uh, struggling to get up this side. Uh, I, I think the new playground here at West Park is going to, it, it's not going to look like what we had before, and it's right. not going to look like uh, what we have at Central Park, but I think it's going to have that that scope and scale that that gives that inner blending that you're seeing at Central Park, with a reflection of the the creek, not as literal, but that linear experience. So linear. I, I, that yeah. was the, the younger kids one, right? With a bluff, yeah. with a bluff now, so and waterfalls too. But yeah, yeah I, but I think there's a there's a whole range of where that play spray experience, you know, could happen here for all these ages too. So. And then we can mix and match. You know, it could be a bit of both, could be a north, could be a south, could be in the river, all those things specifically either or. Yeah. 
it's like we're at uh, the teddy bear store, store where you can build your own bear and you literally can, can uh, help us uh, continue to build this bear. Well, again, I think we're sort of running out of uh, at least the direct questions. We're going to be here. We definitely want to get your feedback. We'll get you your, your stickers so that you can prioritize the things that, that you most like and, and help mix, mix and match it. Uh, we're also here to answer questions. Uh, and this isn't a one and done. So if you know you go home and you think of something, uh, please reach out to us uh, on our website, homemadeparks.com. Uh, this presentation, we are videotaping it, so it will be available so you can review it, you can share it with your, your, your friends, your family members, uh, your neighbors. Um, and there will be mechanisms by which you can give us additional feedback. So we, we like I said, this isn't a one and done. We're interested in keeping the discussion going, and uh, we'll share all of that. The concepts will be online on the parks website, so you can take another look at them.